as we start. So um, I will start saying hello to everyone and giving welcome to everyone joining us today. Uh, I am, have this wonderful pleasure uh, to open another Harvard Brazil Dialogue online. Uh, today we have a very interesting conversation with great speakers, really honored to to have this group here with us. Uh, my name is Elena Monteiro. I'm the director of the Harvard Brazil office um, as part of the uh, David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. I'm honored to have today with us the Brazil office advisor, Dr. Paula Lozano. Uh, Paula is the director of the School of Education at the Diego Portales University in Chile. She has served as a consultant for several non-government organizations and governments in Brazil and Latin America, and also for international organizations such as UNESCO, IDB, and the World Bank. Uh, Paula holds an MA in International Comparative Education from Stanford University and a doctoral degree in Administration, Planning, and Social Policy from Harvard University. Uh, her research interests inc include equality of education opportunities, something that we'll discuss today, I hope, and design, implementation, and evaluation of educational policies in Brazil and Latin America. So Paula kindly agreed uh, to, to moderate the discussion today. Thank you very much, Paula. Today we will focus on the impact of COVID-19 and the challenges it brings to higher education. Uh, this conversation will last about an hour, an hour and 10, 15 minutes. It depends on, on the questions and the interest of participants. Um, you can submit your questions at the Q&A feature at the lower bar of your Zoom screen. Um, we may not have time to answer all the questions, but we'll select a few to bring to the discussion and to, uh, to be addressed by our guest speakers. So without taking more of your time, I, um, I will ask Paula to introduce the speakers. And so Paula, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marilena. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming to this virtual meeting. Thanks, Marcelo. Thanks, Margot. Uh, I think we already faced like one challenge. I, was, I didn't know people were listening and I just started talking when I thought it was like a private conversation among just the panelists. I was just talking to everybody else. So I think I, we just started by showing like alive, like one challenge of online education. I think that many, we have many examples. I'm very happy today to have with us uh, Margot Gill. She's the Administrative Dean for International Affairs in the Faculty of Arts and Science at Harvard. Um, she's an archeologist. She has an MA and a PhD in archeology span at BU. Um, she has had multiple positions in Graduate School of Education of Arts and Science and also at Harvard at large. So I think she knows a lot and, and her contribution to what we, it's happening, uh, it's really important given the experience she has. She also uh, chairs the University Committee on General Scholarships and, and Overseas Agreements and Government Relationships. Among them, we, the one with Brazil. And, and so we are very happy to have here. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Marcelo, um, I had a pleasure to meet him. We, we were visiting scholars together at Stanford. Uh, he, he, he's a physicist. He's a BA, he has a BA in physics and a PhD in science. He's a great researcher, very well known in his area. His area of interest is, is magnetism uh, and magnet materials, very specific. And also the popularization of science and technology in higher education. Since 2017, uh, Marcelo, who is a full professor at Unicampi, Unicampi is one of the major, the most important universities in Brazil, together with USP, they're like on the top of the ranking. Uh, he has agreed to the challenge of being the president of the university. And he is facing this big challenge as president, not so long ago. So welcome. I'm going to start with the first question. Some of you already heard, of, heard, <laughs> heard the question. Um, I think education, as many industries um, uh, and higher education specifically, was severely impacted by, by what happened by COVID-19. As in many areas, we had to make quick decisions. And one of the decisions that we, many of the universities in 175 countries, according to the World Bank, uh, 
decided to move to online education or distance learning. And this decision had to be made very quickly. We didn't prepare well. At least this is my experience here in Chile. So we were kind of forced to implement those changes and moving out of campus and do distance learning. Among um, the problems or the challenges that we, ha we have been facing are the issues of inequality, inequality in the access uh, or in connectivity or access of equipment of some of our students. We, when they were on campus, somehow they had access because universities provide that. Uh, also related to quality of teaching, most of the research universities, and this is the case of Unicom, and this is the case of Harvard, uh, they were based on face-to-face uh, -face learning, both undergraduate level and graduate level. So the quality of teaching is also a challenge and also the social and emotional impact of this whole moving on students and also faculty, right? So how has your university faced those three challenges and what is the contribution you can give us to the debate? Let's start with Margot, please. Hello, thank you so much. And, and just before responding, I must say that, that both on a personal level, but on behalf of, of all of us at Harvard, the opportunity to have this conversation, the opportunity to thank the leadership of, of the Brazil office, uh, the Harvard Brazil office, but also the faculty leadership for our Brazil studies program and for the David Rockefeller Center. I'm just enormously grateful to have a dialogue at a time when we, all of us, can feel isolated and then unsure of, uh, about how our institutional responses compare with, with so many of, of our sister institutions around the world. So thank you. Thank you for this gathering and thank you for this question. I thought I might lead off then, and, and it'll be important to understand how we compare uh, in terms of this issue of inequity, the inequalities uh, in terms of access to learning. That's something that immediately when we realized, and this was mid-March, uh, we gave students five days to exit, to evacuate the campus. For many of them, that will be a set of five days that they will remember always. Uh, but in those five days, which is now about 10 weeks ago, I must say, for many of us, that seems, that seems a lifetime ago, but 10 weeks ago, only 10 weeks ago, right? Students evacuated the campus. And what we knew, and I thought I'd just give us two or three examples where we might compare uh, responses and compare notes on how did Harvard take action? We knew that, that there would be real challenges presented to all of our students, undergraduates and graduate students, as we made this pronouncement, you must leave in five days time. Harvard took immediate action. I'll give us three quick little examples of, of what seemed to us that we needed to do in order to begin to address some of the questions of inequality and how students are impacted so differently depending on, on many of their personal circumstances. We realized that we needed to assist students uh, in leaving the campus. We needed to pay for, and it was the cost of, of their departure, providing resources, personal resources for moving. There were thousands of boxes in Harvard Yard. I can attest to that. It's where my main office is. Uh, thousands of boxes with trucks from, from all of the delivery services, moving services. We needed to pay for and help facilitate students moving home. We have over 5,000 international students. We needed to be sure that they could get home. So it was traveling home, it was storing their items, just the act of moving. And then we recognized, and so this is really a different part of that same response. And I might say this to, if there were families or students, uh, prospective students uh, in our listening group, what we also realized was that there were gonna be many students. It's one thing to, to set up tickets to go home. It's another thing to recognize there were many students who couldn't go home who both couldn't go home because there were already the beginnings of borders closing, fewer flights, uh, as well as in many cases where students didn't have anywhere to go to. And that's both for domestic students as well as for international students. And so we needed to quickly determine how many students, and there was a little process, but it needed to be a careful and thoughtful process, how many students would need to remain on campus 
So for all of our messages of everyone left, well, everyone couldn't leave. And so a second issue in terms of, of inequality or the, our worries about how circumstances were just so different for many of our students was to be able to provide housing. We recognized that housing in our dormitories or in our undergraduate houses, we had to move everyone around the campus to de-densify uh, the housing with really strict social distancing guidelines, not about just six feet, but making sure that, that everyone who remained on campus understood that there was a very different set of guidelines for them in our housing. It's at that moment, I just thought I'd quickly uh, take note that, that Harvard alumni around the world stepped up. There were immediate communications from alumni literally all over the world as well as alumni and just citizens in Cambridge saying, how can we help? I've got to say, those are the moments of, of just feeling a sense of community and support that made all the difference in the world for all of us in the faculty and administration at, at Harvard, but most directly our students. And then there was one other immediate response. And this was something that both required careful discussion and debate and initially wasn't clear, but then needed to become very clear. And that was a change in our grading policy for this most recent spring semester. We're almost finished by, with exams, by the way. We've got a few more days and then we're finished with exams. But that notion that we would change the grading policy for the spring term was both a policy decision as well as a really important statement of, of about and it really was the case that it was equity issues that were the main factor in making a decision that was initially going to be an opt-in, opt-out policy for students that you could move into what I'll describe of, of what was a satisfactory or unsatisfactory grade to, rather than a letter grade. And initially we thought, well, let's see whether this would make more sense if students opted in, opted out. But, you know, it was a wise decision and a really thoughtful communication to the whole community of, of uh, both the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, uh, the college and beyond, from the Dean of the Faculty, Claudine Gay, to say, again, there really is an equity issue here, that many students are being challenged and affected really severely. And so we will move, and this is the language, we will move to a new grading policy for this spring semester. It became one of the grade on a transcript that a student, parents ultimately, but students will see, is emergency satisfactory or emergency unsatisfactory. And you might say, well, is it really necessary to be that explicit that this was an emergency term? We think so, going forward and how people think in the future about graduate training or about how they will represent this term Although I, among others, I think perhaps all of us would say, is it really possible we would ever forget that this is the moment when we were all in higher education and in the world having to, to respond to COVID-19? But just in case we might forget, again, the labeling is meant to say this is an emergency situation and therefore all students have this either sat, satisfactory or unsatisfactory. The concerns that drove us to that decision, and you will understand that that was a difficult decision to make, but it was also one that needed leadership and needed leadership in the moment to be able to say, this will be our policy. The policy then was to recognize that, you know, students do have such a different access uh, to technology, their living circumstances. I was on the phone with, with students last night who now have family responsibilities for younger siblings. Uh, there are others who are in families where the major jobs in the family have been lost. We know that there are issues of both mental health and physical health. When you put all of, of that together along with what we knew, and that's that for so many students, they've lost many of the support networks that were part of their on-campus experience. And with that departure, many of those networks were just dismantled. Putting all of those factors together, Harvard made an unusual but necessary decision, set of decisions about changing the grading policy for the spring term. So just a few examples of what equity, inequity, 
were very much a part of, of how we drove policy early on, even before we started thinking about what quality of education might look like. Okay, thank you, Margot. I think it was really interesting, and I imagine how hard it was, this discussion. We've been trying to do that discussion in my university here in Chile. No university here in Chile yet has made a decision like that. And I have to tell you, I'm pretty much the only dean that is supporting that type of policy. There are people telling me, well, pretty much the same arguments that I imagine it, it had, it showed up in, in the discussion at Harvard. But I, want, I would like to turn to Marcelo because I know Unicom also are discussing similar policies related to inequality, that is supporting students in their moving or in their moving to online distance education and also related to grading, which I think are, are very important. So if you can talk a little bit about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting conversation. Uh, here in Brazil, well, at least here in Campinas, it's about uh, lunchtime. So my family is suffering in this home office. I am the responsible at home for, for cooking here. So today they are trying to solve themselves. Uh, for those of you who are also in different uh, places, in different countries. So just to show you here, we have a really beautiful day and we are really facing, uh, and, and this is important to, to mention because we are in a completely different uh, calendar uh, in our universities. In, in Brazil, the, the, the pandemic uh, hit us uh, uh, as soon as we started the semester. So. The semester here in Campinas, in, in, in Brazil as a whole, starts in March and goes uh, through to, to July. So, and we at Unicamp were the first university to, to, to decide to stop or, and to stop the face-to-face, the -face, uh, at least uh, education and, and, and activities at the university. And it was March 12. So there were only a few days of, of classes before uh, we decided to to stop the the face to face uh, meetings, and this was uh, we uh, different from Har from from Harvard. We didn't give a few days. We decided on a, a Thursday, starting on Friday. So that that was the the uh, emergency that had and we had, and of course I, I suffered a lot of pressure from from different places. Uh, the, some people didn't want to stop. The governments at that time didn't uh, thought it was necessary. A uh, few days afterwards, they decided to stop as well. So the, there are a lot of complications on doing so. And, and the other uh, issue is that uh, we, we, we had to, to move to online education from one day to the other. And, and this was really done with a lot of discussion and a lot of, of course, of engagement from the uh, faculty, from the, from the different uh, courses that we have from uh, different um, uh, people who act on this uh, uh, movement. The, the, the issues here, of course, uh, generated a lot of discussion, not only from the from, from, uh, political side, there are uh, people uh, that really think that uh, we should have stopped it and waited until uh, the, the pandemic solves uh, itself. I don't think this is a solution. Of course, we have a lot of issues going online and going to online education, but it's, it's really an emergency. And, and we had to choose what to do from one week to the other. So we decided to keep moving and to keep working as much as possible, trying to, to make a specific move with a one specific word uh, uh, on mind, that was flexibility. The issue of flexibility is extremely important in Brazil. Here we are, Contrary to the states or uh, to other places in the world, our education here is extremely rigid. We have rules and we have a lot of, you know, minor things that make us extremely, make it extremely difficult to change things and to, to make it more flexible for the students. So just to mention, we decided to, of course, not to, to have uh, any frequency of the students or the uh, absence or presence. This is quite obvious, but it, it, was, uh, it was needed to, to, to be decided. 
we also decided that the, any student can drop out at any time. This is usually not allowed uh, without any consequence for their uh, academic degree or for their academic uh, uh, grades and so on. So we uh, also had the issue of uh, inequalities. Uh, many people said, what, what, what are we, we going to do with people that don't have equipment, they don't have computers, they don't have tablets, they don't have internet connection. So we decided also to make uh, a move from one day to the other to start a volunteer program that we didn't have to start a, a, a donations program that in the United States is quite common, as, as mentioned by Margot, uh, the, the alumni plays a, play a, an important role here. We don't have that. And we started from, from scratch, uh, from one day to the other. So we started a donation program that we, we, we got a lot of donations for, from old equipments, from money to, to buy equipment. And we managed to provide more than 1,000 computers for, for poorer students and, and more than 500 uh, internet uh, SIM cards, uh, prepaid internet SIM cards. We also made a, a, an important movement that we, we have a lot of scholarships for, for transportation for the students. We have about 2,000 2, scholarships for transportation. Uh, something like, I would say now it's $40 per month. This is not so much, but we transformed that for uh, a specific scholarship for a uh, remote connection. So the, we, we gave more than 2000 of these uh, scholarships for the students in order to, to have them buying internet plans and so on, and, uh, or even uh, eating better or whatever they want to do with the money. So the, the, the movement was extremely important. And nowadays I would say that most of the cases are uh, solved. We have uh, complicated issues, for example, from a from, uh, few years ago, we started a program of indigenous uh, native Brazilian uh, students and, and they had uh, a lot of issues uh, moving. They, they could not move to their original houses because of, of, the, of the fear of the pandemic to go to, the, to the, 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 their communities. But also we had to take care of them here at the campus in, in our housing and, and so many problems that uh, appeared during this period, but we, uh, uh, we faced that problems uh, uh, point by point. And I believe that now things are, are more, uh, you know, stable and uh, starting working. The, the important issue I would like to stress is that inequalities existed prior to the pandemics. We just simply forgot this uh, at the time, but they are just, uh, you know, uh, surfacing now and they are even worse in this moment, but they were there already. And, and this is something that the uh, higher education institutions have to face every single day and they cannot forget every day. That's it here oh thank you marcelo thank you margot i think um yeah i think you're right marcelo inequality has been uh around us in higher education and we see them in normal times but it's just that it get i mean i think when we are going through something like that it's clear to me that it uh deepens in a moment like that because we try in our normal operation to mitigate some of that inequality by, for example, have computer labs, having access, having an appropriate place for the, the, the student to study, and those disappear in, time, in times like that. But it doesn't disappear to all of the students, it disappears for some of the students, because some of them at home can have that environment and others cannot. For the reasons yeah, I think that Paula, both... yeah, one important point, especially in, in big towns like, uh, let's say, Sao Paulo or here, Campinas. Uh, I have several students that, even in, in the city like Campinas, which is about uh, 1.2 million inhabitants, is not big in the you know in the Brazilian uh, sense. We have students that take about two to three hours to reach the university every day. They take two buses or uh, public transportation, they commute, and they, they spend, let's say, five hours lost in, 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 in commuting from their homes to the university every single day. 
if we can provide these uh, students with a good equipment, with a good internet connection, they can have, uh, you know, a different environment to study. And it probably can, in some cases, very specific cases, we can have uh, even uh, the opposite. We can reach, uh, you know, a, a better solution for some students. So uh, we can, we can, we, we need to make a more, I would say a survey or a study in order to really understand what's going on and how all this, uh, all this online education and what we can really get from that and keep it after this uh, moment uh, disappears. This is yeah, you have a good point, Marcelo. I think, yeah, inequalities in, in Latin America are, are, are huge. And you just mentioned one of them that in a way uh, disappear when you have a pandemic uh, thing. I think, I think another point that you have that is interesting relates to the fact that inequalities there, somehow bringing it, because it deepens somehow in this moment, it's important because it comes to the, to the center of the debate. And I think this is an important thing. Uh, I wanna move to the quality of education. And we have a very interesting question that was sent, sent by Alexandre Schneider. Hi, Alexandre. Alexandre is, is, is a good friend. Uh, he's now in New York. He's a visiting scholar there um, at Columbia University. Uh, and he has been the secretary of education for the municipality of Sao Paulo. Uh, so, um, very interested in teacher preparation, and he, he asked the question, and Margot, I will, I will ask this question to you and to Marcelo. He said, teacher training requires considerable amount of practical activity in, in schools, and how does uh, this pandemic uh, uh, deems the possibility of, of having this training, and not only for teachers, like all, there are some professions that needs a lot of practical training among them dentistry and, and even medicine, because sometimes even though we, are, we can think like they're very needed at this time, if they're like first or second year students, they must not be in, in that environment. So how is Harvard and Unicom handling this, uh, this specific thing related to the quality of education and, and in a broad sense, the quality of teaching? So um, may I also just touch on, on something that, that Paulo, that, that you and Marcelo had, had just said before this good question, and that is really underscoring the importance of recognizing now and going forward what these inequities are about. Absolutely, these were underlying issues for our societies, underlying issues for our universities, and everything that we have done and will still need to do, we haven't touched on this yet, of, of what the fall and a longer period in online learning is going to bring to us, may very well, we need to make sure that we have learned good lessons and that we carry over some fair amount of, of what we've been able to do to begin to address and resolve some of, of this question of, about access to learning. So I just think that there is much that, that we will want to continue to hold on to and share across our sister institutions as we go forward. You know, I think so many of the challenges, and I just wanted to use the, and I'm inspired by this notion that, that for Unicamp, you moved uh, to the online uh, in a day's time and two days time. We thought it was beyond possible that we had two weeks to move to this new online learning. And I think that the, the notion of how quickly all of that had to happen was something that, that was just terrifically worrisome, both about the, what are the skills, so to the question, what are the skills, what's the experience, that is just uneven, uneven for our students. Some of them have done other online courses, they have taken advantage of MOOCs, they have, have had opportunities to be just simply better able to address online learning. And for our faculty and our graduate students, I think the challenge as we moved in this two week period to online learning. We needed to mount, and this is just some of, of the Harvard numbers, uh, in two weeks time, 1200 courses had to go online. And I'm gonna tell you that, that as we look forward in, in response to the question that we've received, you know, that was an uneven experience. As much as I can tell you that in the first day of online, and this was something that, that our IT, uh, central IT, our, our 
uh, Croatian uh, group uh, had to face a 400% increase in help desk questions in that first day. Uneven would be the case both from the experience, both from students as well as from faculty. But the rest of the unevenness, I think we do have something important to do and to have learned from. And that's that it was inspiring how many faculty and how many of our graduate students who are serve as, as teaching fellows were able to move really quite successfully to the online environment. What was necessary was to do more than just simply be in a lecture status uh, in that format of a computer and, and a faculty member and, and the graduate uh, teaching fellow. What we needed to do was learn from others and what has been inspiring across the institution, from the medical school, from the business school, from our school of, of education, that faculty who were more comfortable and have been more comfortable with an online learning platform because they've been a part of, of Harvard X or that they have, have been in other settings to use online learning and to think about what's quality in online learning and especially how to share new pedagogical approaches that leverage technology. And that's the sharing that quite frankly hasn't occurred much across the campus that needed in this crisis needed to happen across all of our curriculum, needed to be part of, of the way that we would share the best of information. There's also a site, and I just want to mention it to our, those who are participating with us, but also to, to directly to, to those of us on this panel, you know, what we put up immediately and using or better using some of, of the resources at Harvard, there is the Derek Bach Center for Teaching and Learning. And that's been a service that has been available to graduate students and to our faculty for a very long time. But it is in a different place now. And at some moment, I hope people will visit the Bach Center's Teaching Remotely site. What's really exciting about what we know we have to be able to do differently and better with students and with our, our faculty is really excellent suggestions about how to build rapport and connection in an online setting. It's not just about how the information is being delivered. It's thinking about what's the quality of the connection. And if, when, and if, as people want to take a look at, at the Box Center site, I think you're gonna see what are just some really good experienced teachers in the online environment thinking of, about quality of, of the message, quality of, of how the message is, is being presented, and then learning from each other. And those I would suggest to us across our universities and across higher education, we have to be better at sharing that information about the ways that the new ways to, to ensure that the courses are, are interacting, faculty and, and students are interacting, some of it's going to be about tutorials or project-based learning. It can't be the case that we will come out of this crisis without much better tools to stretch ourselves beyond just the in-classroom experience and to take advantage of what we're learning now about better opportunities and better connectivity in an online environment. We also are going to have to face the fact that, that there are, I think, for all of our institutions, there are going to be some really important questions, and this will trip eventually, I hope, in our conversation into what we've learned so far, whether we had one day, two days, or two weeks. We've learned a good deal of, uh, about why, why some of this was uneven and what has not been successful. Students are wonderfully vocal about what has not been successful. They're very helpful about helping us see what's worked and what hasn't worked. We're gonna count on that because this is a shared proposition. We need to be listening and polling our students, and we are doing that to be sure with our students and their families what is it that they're missing in the connection that is no longer a face-to-face -face connection? We've got much to learn, but we're on our way. And I think this is going to serve us well as we come out of, of this crisis. Well, uh, I'm, before I, I move to Marcelo, uh, Antonio Seabra, he mentioned uh, this experience that Margot also mentioned related to Harvard having uh, some of the professors working online on not uh, undergraduate programs or graduate programs like the regular programs, 
but having like a base of online education that uh, we at least have here in Chile, my university doesn't have, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, Unicom does have, which makes the experience of the professors less prone to online, which made it harder this change. So uh, Marcelo, how, how was that handle at Unicampi? And also, uh, I would like you to address the practical uh, training of den uh, dentists and, and teachers and how, how are you doing, thinking about it since they cannot go and, or having this practical training? Well, of course, uh, there are many experiences. We have out here about 2,000 faculty members and, and we have all sorts of experiences from very successful ones to a disastrous uh, situation. So we have uh, for example, faculty members that they are used to. Here in Brazil, we have this phenomenon of having so many classroom hours. Uh, and this is not only in Brazil, in Latin America as a whole. And sometimes there are class, classes that uh, uh, are four hours, direct classes. And, and some professors, they just kept doing the same, four hours online. You can imagine that this is a torture. So this is something that, uh, you know, it's a learning experience as well for the for the teachers and the professors. They they have to learn how to deal with a, a new kind of environment and a new kind of experience. And there are so many ways to do that in some in some places and others not. For example, as mentioned before, sorry about that. The dog here is uh, barking. Uh, the situation of, for example, practical learning. It's important, you know, in, in the health area, it's, it's, it's fundamental to have contact with the patients or in music here, we have a, a, a huge, or in arts, here we have a lot of uh, uh, practical uh, situations that are impossible to do online. But so many we, we don't do, but are possible. Let, let me give you an example of my area, which is physics. I teach, for example, uh, here, experimental physics one. Uh, which we have a lot of teachers doing that and, and we keep the students and they have some experiments and so on. When I was, when I went to Harvard to visit the, the physics department there and the, the experience they have, instead of having different experiments every single week, as we have here during 15 weeks, let's say, they just mentioned, for example, let's say uh, you have one semester to, to obtain the value of the, the acceleration of gravity, G, uh, for whichever means you want. So you decide, you, you, you look at the internet, you look at the references, and, and after one semester, you give me the solution and the, the value that you measured. It's a good example that something that you can do at home, you can do using online instructions and so on, it's, it's not the same, it's a different experience as well, but it's something that is possible maybe to adapt. In many situations, we are able to adapt. And one important issue that I would like to stress, we have this, uh, you know, in this moment, we are in an emergency moment, we are in a pandemic. So what happens if a student don't learn exactly the content that they were used, uh, they needed to learn? So. Maybe the, 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 the teachers, the professors can have this flexibility in order to, to teach different things. One example of a good student from my, my son, he was studying geography. Of course, the content that he was supposed to teach was different, but we're in a pandemic. So the, he decided to give the students a, a task to write a paper about the spread of the pandemics around the world during this, uh, this situation. Well, it's not exactly what he was supposed to teach, but it was geography related. It was, uh, you know, something related to the situation that we are facing now. This engaged the student much more, and the, it's an important way in order to have a discussion, to have everyone together learning, discussing, you know, the sense of community, which is so important in this moment. So uh, we should be flexible about the content and, the, uh, and I believe that the more, you know, a general education, more uh, trying to go in this uh, moment to more uh, kind of a sort of liberal arts education that would be much more useful for everyone's life for the rest of, uh, you know, of this pandemic and, and for the rest of their lives. 
Thank you, Marcelo. Um, Sorry, I just one, one important oh. point. And of course, we are still in the begin in the semester. So we hope that sometime we will have some time to do, you know, practical uh, hours as well at the end of the semester, maybe in July, maybe in August. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. see if it maybe. happens. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to share a little of the experience because we are a teacher training school, the one that I, uh, I, I direct. And this, uh, this is the big concern since one third of the curriculum is, is totally practical curriculum. And I would say we were working uh, with the possibility that we are coming back to like normal or some face to face interaction, some schools. Like we, we depend on the schools, right? If you have a practical experience in teaching preparation, you need schools to be operating so you can have your students go into schools. So we are imagining that schools are gonna be operating somehow with less students or more in, in August. So we are advancing all the theoretical content in this semester. So we're gonna leave more time for the students to do double the time that they were supposed to do the time they were supposed to do to be in school this semester, they're going to be spending next semester together with the time of the next semester. That means they're, they're doing more theory now. But this has meant rearrange the curriculum, which is not easy when you have a lot of professors with different, different, different classes. Uh, but that, of course, has to do with the fact that here we're, sorry, Marco, uh, in comparison to the US and Brazil, I think Chile is doing pretty well regarding the, the, the dealing of the of the disease. So we, we re, I really think we're going to be back in August. Sorry, Michael. No, I just, I want to listen to and appreciate your optimism. However, we think about that opening timetable, I think we need to continue to share, just as you two have, what the best of our examples are where we have already rearranged curriculum. And it has to do very often, as you've said, with, it's with lab-based courses. So where we've said, here's, here's what we're able to do in sharing even data sets, sets from the previous semester and student do, students do the analysis in small groups, uh, but it's all an online process. And we know that we're going to have to, to have what is the more practical lab-based module if you will, later on. And whether it's in the fall or whether it's in, in the next spring term, I think we're all not only expecting that we need to make those kinds of, of adjustments, and I really appreciate the notion of, of flexibility. Everyone has had to ensure that there was not going to be business as usual, lab-based or not, that there would be an opportunity to break into modules and do some of that additional training at whatever, I want to be sharing your optimism, but whatever the timetable for return is, I think that's what all institutions have good examples of exactly that kind of necessary flexibility. And my goal, the one thing that helps my optimism is that schools here are saying that when, whenever they return, they haven't planned the return yet, they're going to have smaller class sizes or they have, they're going to have some students coming in, the, in some time, others, and they will need more teachers. That's when our students come in, right? So we're, we're thinking we're going to have, we are going to have some uh, time and space for our students to practice, which is a very important part of teacher, teacher education. I want to move- That even more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to move to the looking ahead part. I think yeah. both Marcelo and you uh, touch upon this, uh, future, like future, which is like next semester. In the case of the U.S., we're talking about uh, uh, starting a new cohort. You are having admissions, and some of the questions people are asking here is like, how are you dealing with admissions? Are you going to be more flexible? Maria Jose Ferreira asked here about, are you going to be more flexible about deferrals, fee reduction, scholarships, credits, for example, for international students that usually don't exist so much. And uh, how, how, how is your university planning this return? Michael? So I must say, this is the question and variations of this question that is, this question is on everyone's mind. And that's true globally, and that's true for our collective communities. And I think what we're clear about it at Harvard, Harvard has said definitively, you have to be careful about how I'm going to say this, definitively, that it will be open 
for the fall semester. That decision has been taken. What is not clear yet, and so we have to say, but, 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 what's not clear yet, and probably won't be clear, and I'm gonna be very careful about a timetable because dates, when it's not data-driven dates that are being pronounced now are, are hard to, to fully appreciate. But we imagine that sometime in, in June and July, there will have to be a decision about whether we are open in not online, but in person on the campus. And that decision, again, is going to, to be sometime late uh, June, uh, early July. But to the questions of, about what does admissions look like now? And I'm gonna keep underscoring because it surely is the watchword for everything that we're all experiencing, not just in this conversation. And that's that yes, Harvard has, has just completed its admissions activities and because I have responsibility university-wide on some of, of our major scholarships that cross all the university's programs, all of our graduate and professional schools and our college. Yes, Harvard is, is now in the midst of, of reviews for deferrals. Students are already asking for deferrals. Will Harvard be deferring? Harvard's gonna be deferring, I hope, in the most sensible and most importantly, sensitive way. And that sensitivity has to be about looking at, and I'm gonna use a couple examples because they were on my screen yesterday from the School of Public Health candidates uh, who have major Harvard scholarships, uh, who clearly as, as first, uh, responders as frontline workers in their countries. Remember, Harvard is, is an enormous international population. These are, these are candidates who, because they want to continue to serve in their countries, they have asked for deferrals. Will those deferrals be granted? They've already been granted, right? That wouldn't ordinarily be the case. Ordinarily, students are wanting to make good progress. They're wanting to get underway with, with their additional qualifications. But yes, deferrals are already underway. The big question then is, is, and this is sometimes a little uneven, and that's that the students uh, who are current students who also are thinking carefully ab uh, about whether they want to have a leave of absence, those again require flexibility and are students wanting to take a leave in the case that, that if we're on online, they don't want to miss out on all of the community related learning. So those two are being reviewed, and I think that the, what is necessary is that Harvard will be both generous and thoughtful of, about all of these requests for an interruption, whether it's as deferrals or as, as leaves of, of absence. The question then needs to be, and I assume uh, we're all thinking of, about this, is that, that what about the resources that are already guaranteed as part of, of students' uh, admissions? Will those resources be available if students defer? In some cases, those resources are already guaranteed as part of, of larger endowed scholarships at, at Harvard. And if a student has, you have to follow this through, if a student has a deferral from their school at, at Harvard, then the resources from these scholarships follow that deferral. For other resources that are need-based aid at, at our schools, uh, the expectation is that if students have, have asked for a deferral, they'll apply again the next year or whenever they return uh, or come to, to Harvard, it's not returning, it's coming to Harvard for the first time, they'll be applying again for, for their need-based aid. Those are hard conversations for students and their families, for us across all of our faculties at Harvard to be thinking about what does the intake of the next class look like? And really important, and this then goes back to where we started, really important to be clear about how soon are we going to be able to make a statement of, about whether we will be in person or online for the fall. So many other decisions are triggered by that large set of decisions. And so, if in fact we're able to, to make some sense to ourselves about what's going to help us make that decision about whether we're online or in person. You know, you have been clear about what it looks like in Chile and, and in, in Brazil. You know, I think for Harvard at the moment, following both government guidelines, and that's the CDC, it's also following state by state, uh, following the governor of, of Massachusetts, who in the headlines this morning in the Boston Globe, in the opening of this state, 
will be driven by data and not about a specific date plucked out of a calendar. So knowing that, and as we try to think about what are the guiding principles that must be in place in order to make a, a, an important decision about when we will come back into campus. Clearly, health and safety are first. You know that in every statement that Harvard issues, health and safety are, are first. Protecting, and this is important, the academic enterprise, that's both ab about teaching as well as research. And some of you have asked me uh, in other conversations, you see that Harvard has already announced a plan for phasing in the reopening of our labs, of our museums and our libraries. So that's balancing the research agenda and the teaching agenda, right? And those can be, they are, are of course interdigitated, but those are different calendars and one that, that again, we've already announced uh, the plans for opening our, our labs. We're going to, to Harvard e really urgently needs to open up its labs. Uh, science uh, and our labs need to continue. Many of our labs, and this is important, we're going to be following for this staged and phased in opening of, of the labs. We're going to follow the protocols from the Harvard labs that have been open. They have continued because they are the primary con contributors from Harvard uh, to COVID-19 uh, research, right? So we're gonna follow their protocol, both in terms of, of repopulating our labs, as well as thinking of, about what are all of the issues of phasing and staging in, as well as all of, of the protective equipment that of course is, is going to be necessary. So as with almost everything else we've touched, these questions about both deferrals, leaves of absence, opening or not opening, we will be open, but in person or online then just begs for the research agenda as well as for the teaching agenda, a whole series of, of other questions and of principles that we need to be clear about. What are the principles that will drive the decision to open? Thank you, thank you, Margot. I think in the sense of um, starting a new cohort in times of COVID-19, I think Latin America has some experience to share because that's exactly what happened uh, in Brazil and in Chile. So Marcelo, what, what, is the, what are the plans for, uh, for next semester? It's some- Well, uh, in fact, the, the, the issue is, there are, there are similar issues, but of course there are many different uh, issues as well. So. Here, being a public university, we also have an important problem of, you know, we provide uh, meals for the, all the community, the students and the staff. We have around, we, have, we provide breakfast, lunch and dinner for our community. And uh, it's more or less 10,000 meals per, per, you know, uh, period. So it's a mess to, 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 to organize that because we have a limited space and how do we, do it? for example, this is an issue, just, I'm just mentioning, you know, a specific issue that happens here and not anywhere else. Uh, we have a, a big public uh, uh, hospital here. We, we provide health for the region here for 6.5 million inhabitants. So most of the uh, organ, uh, you know, the, the, all the buying uh, stuff, uh, you know, all the, uh, the, this infrastructure needed to be consolidated during this time and, and working better than, uh, every, better than ever in order to make the hospitals uh, to work properly during this pandemic, for example. And, and we are working, you know, uh, uh, as well as in, in Harvard, many, many uh, research labs are working uh, in, you know, in, in, in testing, in vac vaccines, and, you know, in new re uh, respirators and so on. So we are trying to, to organize, uh, you know, the plan for returning in a very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, slow, slow pace, trying to make it happen, you know, uh, in, in a very slowly. The problem is as, as well as uh, Margot, Margot told us, we don't know when. We have 
a little bit of a, a starting a plan uh, of how we will return. You know, the idea is to return 20% uh, each two weeks. So slowly returning to work. And after that, trying to accommodate everyone until three phases of, you know, returning after three months of, you know, slowly returning. The problem is that we don't know when it will start. And the second problem that we face here is that we have this big uh, entrance exam called vestibular here in Brazil. In, uh, at Unicam, just to, to have you to have an idea, we have about 80,000 uh, applicants for 3,000 places that we offered. And we are already planning the exam for the uh, end of the year, because for the next, uh, for the next year. And uh, this is a, 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 an infrastructure problem because we don't have, uh, in some places that we provide this uh, exam, we don't have even schools in order to make the social distancing uh, to, to accommodate all the, the candidates. So this, th there are so many questions, so many uh, small things that we have to think about. This is uh, very, very complicated to think in a, in a moment that we really don't know when the situation will become uh, better. Even though we, uh, uh, the other problem is that uh, everyone in the world will face is that even though we decide to return, there will, will, be, there will be many people that will, we, uh, will not be uh, able to return. They don't want to return. They, the, the parents will not uh, give them permission to return. So there are so many, uh, variables in this in this uh, equation that is very complicated to understand how it would really happen. They, we will try to keep moving the online education everywhere where it's possible to keep the, uh, working with online education. We will try to you know to make it happen. Uh, the training of teachers, the training of professors, uh, how to deal with better classes online, and 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 also. The, the you know uh, a communication with the the student the students showing that we don't really don't know the future and probably this situation will can le can last an extra semester an extra year we really don't know so we will have to face uh, uh, this uh, you know extraordinary times uh, in in some proper manner so. Uh, there are so many questions. My, my personal point is that in this case, the future is nebulous. We don't really know what will, what will happen. And so we have to keep the mission of the university in our hands and try to, to use it as, as a guide. That's, that's the only thing that I, I, I can offer as a, a better solution for the future. We really don't know. Thank you. Just underscore Apollo that I think that's exactly right that it's the mission of our universities it's our guiding principles that's what we really have to keep repeating to ourselves reiterating because that's what's going to get us through this and allow us some more clarity of, uh, about when we believe it will be safe for us to make a, a fundamental change in, from the online environment I also think that, that what we're all saying is that, that what we're all doing right now is not standing back. We're just continuing to plan for a wide range of alternatives and we'll continue to do that. We don't know what our decisions will be come June or July, but everything is on the table now. That wide range of alternatives, they're all being planned for, they're being costed out, as well as, as what's the additional likelihood, back to the good questions of, uh, about the notion of, of deferrals. We also are terrifically concerned given that Harvard values so much its diversity included in that is the international diversity. The likelihood that students are going to get visas in any kind of timely way is just a whole other set of questions for us, both in crossing country borders, but also the likelihood of delayed, very significantly delayed visas. So those just, all of that has to be brought into the equation of what's our timetable and what planning we have to be really careful to be doing. Okay, um, I'm, not, I'm sure the, the, the near future, like Marcelo described and Margot mentioned, it's, it's very confusing, uncertain, uh, 
nebulous. I think that was the question. <laughs> that was the word that Marcelo used to. Uh, an optimist, optimist note, Margot, on what we are going through right now um, by talking to the students. My students are being prepared to be teachers. Some of them said they think this experience is being interesting because as a future teacher, they are facing this challenge as a student. So they're gonna be more prepared as teachers whenever this comes again, as it seems we're gonna be facing things like that in the near future. The uncertainty is part of what those, this generation are gonna leave throughout their lives. So I think something is, is important in the learning, or, or, or in training professionals in this moment, right? Um, but I want to be more optimistic, thinking about the future, like the not the near future, because I, I know, I totally agree, it's not easy to plan, we don't know. But what does it stay? A lot of people have been asking us, like, what do you think we take from this in the long run? What, uh, what, do, what are we learning about the ways in which the university operates, its teaching, its internationalization, its research? that will stay or should stay, or we should make an effort to stay. And, and a lot of people talked about, ask about evaluation, because this is another portion of teaching and learning that has changed during this time. Somehow we have to be more careful about it, and maybe that's some learning thing that stay. So Margot, we'll start with you. I think that we've touched on so many of the lessons learned. I also think, um, and I suppose this is because it's some of, of my personal opportunity is to have contact with so many of our sister institutions around the world. We have a great deal to learn from each other. I've learned a good deal in, in this conversation to think of, uh, about not just the optimism you are feeling uh, in Chile, but also just what uh, Brazil's uh, institutions have been able to weather and, and be a, a good model, a good guide for us. I think there's something else I wanna make sure I touch on and then um, go right back to the core of, of your question. And that's one of the other things that I think we have really learned. And this really, I suppose, is mostly about what are, what's been the emotional impact for our students and for our faculty. And that's something that I think when I listen to, and whether it's podcasts or, or it's our communication now across faculties, across our, our with our students and, and families, and I think everyone has recognized that, that there is just something core to the notion of connection. It's the connection that when it's disrupted, when it is interrupted, whether it's, it's because Zoom isn't working or, or our internet is, is unstable, what we know is that, that when we reach out to our students, and I'm gonna say that, that this has been faculty who have simply done everything, whether it, it, it is social media or it's text or it's just a phone call, just picking up the phone and calling students to say the connection in this community is still not only there and clearly needs to, to be acted on. That's part of what I think we've learned. We didn't, I think, need to be reminded about why those connections in the community, those that are just serendipitous or those that, that are part of every classroom and every exchange, the connections are what make so much of our communities. And to be able to continue to reinforce those connections for, again, an institution that values so much of, about international and about diversity, those connections are and the opportunity to ensure that we're on the phone with people, that we're on the phone with, with our students, to ensure that, that we're connecting with them in the learning space, as well as what their emotional needs are, that needs to carry into whatever the timetable of our future is, because that is part of the learnings, the set of learnings of how do we ensure that we continue to care about the emotional well-being of our community, as well as what it is that, that we may need to adjust in assessment, in learning outcomes, as well as, as the way we think of, uh, about making sure that students and faculty have thought differently in the future about how courses will be assessed, how learning will, will be assessed. So there are many learnings to be had from this time and so much more that we need to, if we're willing to, in this space now, 
across countries, across cultures, that we share these insights and our determination to, to both build on each other's experiences now and for the future. Uh, very good. Um, I think that there are many lessons that will be left from this uh, situation. Well, first of all, you know, I, I usually try to, to, to emphasize the, the importance of this kind of conversations that we are doing right now. Uh, this is a quite a new phenomenon. Usually we would have, uh, you know, a conventional conference. I would invite Margot here, Paula and Elena, we will make a conference and uh, we will spend uh, thousands of dollars and many hours of flights and uh, we will reach, you know, 50 people, 60 people in university, maybe. Here we are reaching much more people. Uh, we are touching many, uh, you know, uh, issues uh, online. And this is something that I would say that will stay. I have been participating in so many of these webinars and conversations and online, you know, and here in Brazil, we have also lives, uh, probably in the States, uh, well, in the States as well. So, uh, you know, music and cultural things and uh, that uh, sometimes we, you would spend, uh, you know, also thousands of dollars in order to go to a stadium. Of course, it's not the same, but uh, it's something interesting that probably will remain. From the from the cultural, uh, you know, I will talk about Brazil. Many cultural things will change. This is for sure. Uh, in, for, in, my, in my opinion, unfortunately for us in Latin America, in, especially in Brazil, there will be less touch and less uh, hugs uh, from people to, so we will go towards more oriental side, no, just uh, uh, greeting uh, in a distance. And this is something that will probably remain forever. Um, and the, in the case of the universities, I, I would say that this is an important learning in Brazil, the philanthropy culture, the, the donations and the alumni uh, contact. And this is something that was, you know, uh, difficult to start. And uh, I believe that this uh, movement that we started now will remain as well. But uh, most important than anything else, I would say that uh, you probably heard that here in Brazil, we were facing a, a strong attack towards the public universities, uh, towards science and so on. And, and I would say that ironically, uh, is that the situation, if we can take something positive about that, is that the, the, the public perception of, of universities, higher education and science changed completely in Brazil. So we we, we went from uh, villains to, you know, the, the heroes of the situation. And this is something that the universities should work uh, in their communication plans, in their strategies, in order to use this momentum, in order to, to improve, you know, the public perception of, of science, technology, uh, entrepreneurship, and of course, higher education. And this is something I hope that it will remain. Uh, you, you know, that they, uh, unfortunately people have a short, uh, you know, uh, memories are rather short term, uh, but I hope that we can work on the universities in order to make this momentum to stay. Uh, and, and I think it's, this is a very positive reaction in terms of what we were sensing in terms of public policies and so on. So this is, I would say, just trying to follow Paula and, and, and finishing with a, you know, a more positive view of the situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's, it's easy what we are going through, but I'm, I'm uh, optimistic also of some of the things. I think Marcelo and Margot mentioned some of them. What I have been seeing here is that the teachers and professors are being more conscious of their teaching and the way the students learn. Because as Margot mentioned, students are very conscious of what is good or not for them. And, they, and I think even though we knew something was wrong before that all this happening, all this happened with teaching and learning in schools and universities, maybe we didn't, we were, we were in a comfort zone. And I think this change through face-to-face -to, -face to online 
made, took us out of our comfort zone and made us face uh, the, 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 the deficit of our, our teaching and learning. And so I don't think, I'm not optimistic in a way to say that I think we we, online we're going to solve all the problems because I think we need face-to-face -face education. Our universities, the three, the three universities that are here, they are complex research universities that need this face-to-face -face and, and believe in this type of connection. And I agreed with Margot, I think the people that are having more um, success in this transition are the ones that had good connections and are keeping those connections. That's why I really don't understand how professors, some in Chile and some in Brazil, are just saying, denying this opportunity to their students because they're against online education. When I think we, they deserve this connection. Our students deserve this connection. And I really want to make a point here because I think this is really a, a part of the commitment that we have as professors at our university. I also see a lot of change in the scientific community. A lot of Congress conferences were canceled and they had to be creative in the ways, the ways in which we still interact with our peers in different places. And somehow, I think, Marcelo, you were right, we were very used to this format. And even when we want to meet internationally, we need to mobilize a lot, of, a lot of resources. So maybe now we're going to have more online conferences or the two types of conferences or either you, if you don't go, you, can, you don't have the resources to go or your country is going through a pandemic. Uh, you, you, can, you can connect online. I think we are, we are being more creative in the ways in which we think of this connection. But I totally agree with, uh, with Margot. Uh, that's what makes us community. And so I'm very happy to be part of this, uh, of this community with Elena as the director of the center. I don't know. I think we, we went through uh, like the topics that we were uh, supposed to. So I want to thank Marcelo and Margot and give the floor to Elena. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Paula. It's a, I would like to thank you and all the Brazil office advisors. It's wonderful to have this group of advisors for the Brazil office so we can count on your support to help us facilitate sessions and conversations like this. Again, thank you, Margot and Marcelo. I know how busy you are. So thank you so much for your generosity in sharing your time with us. And uh, for this wonderful community of participants who are asking questions and stay with us for this you know, hour and 15 minutes. Just an announcement that we have two more uh, conversations online, conversations this week and two more next week. Tomorrow we have a very interesting one on the history of epidemics uh, in Brazil with Harvard professor um, Shalhoub and the Federal University of Bahia professor João Hayes. So join us tomorrow, it will be at 4 p.m. Brazil time. And that, that conversation will be in Portuguese. But those, and by the uh, way, Cecilia Shalhoub is uh, retired from Unicamp. Oh, so, there you go. We'll see how we are all connected. <laughs> Let's claim talent wherever it sits at the moment. Very good friends. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope you can join us, Marcel. It's going to be a very okay. interesting conversation. I will conversation. try. I will try. Yes. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So thank you all, and uh, we'll keep in touch, keep involved with us, and thank you so much, Margo, Marcelo, and Paula. This is what keeps universities strong and keeps our collective communities together. Thank you. Heartfelt. Thanks so very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye everybody. Thanks, everybody, the 110 people that join us. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. Bye-bye.